Welcome to this series of short videos on the Secure Pork Supply Plan. They are intended to supplement the information found at the website securepork.org. My name is Dave Wright and I'm the Minnesota Coordinator for this project. This video will focus on African Swine Fever. African Swine Fever is another one of the foreign animal diseases that causes septicemia. It has achieved a lot of notoriety recently because uh, it moved originally from East Africa into the Balkan states and Eastern Europe. And now uh, it, we know that it's found all throughout Russia and into most of China and into Mongolia and Vietnam. So the distribution has become uh, pretty severe. It's also traveled in quite a bit into uh, Eastern Europe and even they found it as close right here to within a few miles of France in wild boars. So the disease is moving quickly and frighteningly close to put it at risk to the United States. African swine fever virus is actually a mildly contagious virus with an incubation period of only of 3 to 21 days, so quite variable. It has multiple strains, again, so it manifests itself in a variety of ways. Surprisingly, it has quite a low mortality originally in a, an infected population, but a tremendously high case fatality in an individual pig. So once a pig is infected with the virus, about 95% of the time that pig is going to die in a domestic pig. The virus is highly stable and resistant to many disinfectants. And it has the added feature of having a soft tick as a vector, depending on the range that you might find that tick. This is African swine fever in Russia. And this is the classical form with a high death loss. And once it gets into a population of pigs, even if the pigs don't die, those pigs will have to be euthanized and depopulated. So it's a frightening scene for any of us in the United States. The African swine fever virus is found in secretions, in blood, and muscle tissue. And it can also be transmitted by eating tissue that's infected with the virus or garbage. Another unique situation with this virus is that there's a soft tick that's an additional host. Now, it's not found often in the United States, but it is significant. And if this little guy, and this is not a hard tick like we've got, it's a soft tick, and, but it can bite uh, an infected animal and then it lives off of, the, off of the pig. It doesn't live on its host, but it can hide in the burrow for up to five years and bite another pig that would move in and still be infectious. So it's a really unique thing. And that's one of the things that can cause this uh, a wild population of pigs to be provide a silent carrier. Ornithodorus is the type of tick, of the soft tick. But as you can see, although it plays a very high role in perpetuating the problem in Africa, it's only been found in a range in this part of Asia and in this part of Europe. Um, the range in the United States, there are some soft ticks that we have in the western part of the United States, but it's unknown whether or not they can carry the African swine fever virus. It's a relatively stable virus. Uh, it can be found in frozen meat indefinitely, in dry meat and fat for almost a year, in blood, salted meat, and opal for more than three months, and in manure for more than a week. And it even can survive the putrefaction process in a carcass, so it can remain infectious for weeks if a wild boar dies of, of uh, African swine fever. There are some disinfectants that will work for it. Vircon is perhaps the most uh, commonly used, but you have to use it just as directed in order for it to be effective. It's a very difficult organism to kill. This, combined with the fact that it's a very slow pig-to-pig -pig contagious uh, problem and the variable incubation period, means that it might take a long time to detect it. Dr. Culhane at the University of Minnesota has found that it might take 28 days from the time that the viral infection begins until it's discovered 
if you use a mortality trigger of more than five deaths per thousand pigs per day. This has other implications for surveillance. Dr. Klaus Deppner, uh, who has studied the disease in Germany, has been quoted to say, if you look for African swine virus, virus in healthy pigs, you just won't find it. <clears throat> you have to look for it in sick and dead pigs. So we need to do a lot of postmortems. If you're looking for this in postmortems, think of African swine virus as, virus as the Ebola virus of pigs. It's all about hemorrhage. We've got a lot of cyanosis and blotchiness in the skin, both in the rump and on the ears and face, even on the snout. One of the big things that features about it is that the spleen, it becomes very large and friable. It's also an easy tissue to identify, and the spleen has now become one of the tissues the diagnostics lab will look for in the screening process. So submit spleen, and also lymph node. As you'll see here, there's a lot of hemorrhage in the lymph nodes. The heart has a lot of blotchiness that uh, you can see with hemorrhages and a lot of fluid in that pericardial sac. This is a kidney that has been infected with African swine fever virus, and you see the mottled hemorrhagic appearance. There are many routes of uh, infection for African swine fever. <clears throat> but the areas that are providing the greatest risk to our country is food that's brought illegally into our country. Also, feeding uncooked garbage is a high risk. People carrying the virus because it's such a stable, if they've been on a farm where it's, the virus is present, they can easily carry it into the country. And it can be imported in feed ingredients. And then, of course, if hunters are uh, bringing, trying to bring in some of the wild pig meat or tissue, uh, that's also a significant risk. We have a beagle brigade that has been very helpful in trying to identify some of these illegal imports. As a matter of fact, this is what they found, the beagle brigade found in Chicago O'Hare in one day. It looks to me like a grocery store. The risk is not confined to the United States. I like this particular picture because it it, take, it takes about $200,000 to breed and, uh, and train one of these dogs for the Beagle Brigade. And I thought this is pretty amazing that he's able to uh, not eat this pig that he found in, a, in the luggage. It's not unique to the United States. They found contaminated and in, uh, infected tissue in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Australia. Combine that, that uh, there is a fair amount of garbage feeding that's allowed in the United States. Uh, notice that it's in Florida, Texas, and all on the West Coast, and even in Minnesota. Now, you're supposed to cook the garbage in Minnesota for, at 212 degrees for 30 minutes all throughout. But, of course, that is a problem that might easily be overlooked. Combine that, that the feral swine in the United States includes a lot of the same areas, Florida, Texas, in California, where it could possibly infect that population. And this is the area where soft ticks can be found, even though they may or may not be a, a factor in the United States. African swine fever can also survive in feed ingredients that have been imported and crossed the ocean. You'll notice that there are a lot of the different uh, products that can uh, enable the virus to survive that journey. And it's a simulated journey that Dr. D and South Dakota State and Kansas State University have worked on. African swine fever is unique that it's made the journey even in the container without a substrate. So this information has led the uh, feed suppliers to have developed seven critical points to try to minimize the risk of infection. And they've established holding periods of 78 days for uh, non-secure facilities, that is bag feed, and up to 286 days for bulk ingredients. Now, in addition to trying to minimize the import of high-risk feeds, they're also attempting to develop other mitigation strategies to try to minimize the risk of this source of infection. So to conclude, the risk of African swine fever introduction to the United States is high <clears throat> due to people, international travel, foreign guests, 
illegally imported meat, and contaminated feed ingredients. Early detection is going to be difficult. It has a low contagiousness and a low mortality in a population despite a high case fatality. This low prevalence carries other implications. Surveillance must focus on dead and sick pigs and passive surveillance on healthy pigs is oftentimes unrewarding and is, uh, but still needs to be done. But post every pig and investigate even when you might have low levels of death loss that are unexplained. But surveillance is improving. We can now submit spleen, lymph node, and tonsil in addition to whole blood that's available for testing. Oral fluids is being considered and if the sensitivity is adequate to identify a low prevalence, that will also be something that will be an, a very effective tool. African swine fever virus is very stable in the environment. So our cleaning and disinfectant protocol must be tailored to African swine fever. And it doesn't necessarily work to use the same protocol that we've used for other diseases, which makes it very difficult to eliminate from a premises with multiple barns or rooms. It's also stable in meat and blood. So if we can remove any dead pigs from a pen immediately, that's going to minimize the chance of passing it on to other pigs that might chew on it. And don't feed garbage or table scraps, particularly if it hasn't been effectively uh, heat treated. There's no vaccine that's available. Antibodies are not protective. And surprisingly, animals, the, the few animals that might recover can be reinfected. So it doesn't stimulate a good immune response. But enhanced biosecurity can prevent site infections. So I'd like to express my acknowledgement and thanks to these individuals for helping provide the information for this video. And this series of videos has been produced with the help of the Minnesota Board of Animal Health and the University of Minnesota Swine Extension staff. Thank you for your interest in the secure pork supply.